Hello, good afternoon, and thank you for coming to our lecture today at the Academy, and thank you to those folks that are Zooming in with us. I thought I'd give you a weather report for those of you that aren't in Columbus. It's now freezing at night, so everything's dead outside or near dead. Um, and we're going to be barely above freezing for a few days. The other thing I read this morning was the rankings came out for football playoffs, and we're ranked number one, for those of you that enjoy football. Um, <laughs> and I have a couple other things. This Friday is the deadline for the small grants. The form is online at the website if you want to complete it and apply for a small grant. And November 17th is our deadline for the newsletter. It's to be 250 word narrative, not CV entry style, um, or less than 250. And we would like to have some kind of visual to go with it, whether it's a JPEG of yourself or something that has to do with the research you're talking about in the newsletter. Um, well, let's get on with it here. I'd like to introduce Dwayne Roller, Professor Emeritus of Classics. His most recent position was at Carl Franz Bonds, Distinguished Professor of Classic Studies at the University of Graz in Austria. He received his... Am I not? Okay. All right. You got to let me know. I have to... Yep. Sorry. Should I start over? No? Yes, maybe. Um, he received his PhD from Harvard in classic, classical archaeology and spent 34 years in the archaeology field work in the Mediterranean world. He is the author of 19 academic books, including the best-selling Cleopatra, a biography and empire of the Black Sea, as well as over 200 scholarly articles. His most recent work is the Geographical Guide of Ptolemy of Alexandria, an analysis just published by Rutledge. Further works on ancient geography are under contract at academic presses. He recently was named one of the 150 research and creative innovators in the history of Ohio State. He currently lives in Santa Fe with my old college buddy and first teaching job um, cohort. And she's up there on the screen. Hi, Letty. Um, and there we go. Let me let us welcome Dwayne. Thank you. Thank you, Ardeen, and it's a pleasure to be back here in Columbus after so many years, and it's a pleasure to see people here from all the disciplines. I think that's what makes a university a wonderful place, that there are many different departments and disciplines represented here. I'm going to talk today about one of the most interesting characters of the period of the second and first centuries BC, uh, Mithridates the Great of Pontus. And he uh, he was one of the great opponents of the emergent Roman Empire. But there are two things that we have to consider before we look at him specifically. Uh, one is the well-known fact that history is written by the winners, and we're talking about someone who lost here. So it can be difficult sometimes to get beyond the victor's perspective into understanding what this personality was really like. And the second thing is something that historians always have to deal with that we perhaps inaccurately call the terminal fallacy, and that is we know what's going to happen. We know that Julius Caesar is going to get assassinated. We know that the Trojans are going to lose the war. But of course, the people in the contemporary world didn't know what 
would happen, obviously. This may seem obvious, but it colors our perspective of how we look at classical antiquity, or in fact, any period in the past. Uh, we know what happened, and it's very hard to disabuse ourselves of that and go back and place ourselves in the world of the era that we're going to talk about. So Mithridates lost to Rome, but he didn't know that was going to happen, obviously, until the very end. What I want to do is to go back, for starters, to the period of Alexander the Great, the late fourth century BC. As is well known, Alexander unexpectedly became king of Macedonia and embarked on an expedition that took him all the way to India and back, coming back and eventually dying at Babylon at a relatively youthful age. And the reason that this is important for what we're going to talk about is that it threw the ancient world into total chaos. Alexander's stated purpose was eliminating the Persian Empire, but he died at Babylon in 323 BC with no provision for the future. And all of his satraps and lieutenants and officers and so forth, remnants of the Persian Empire, spent the next 40 years competing for what was under. And it's in this situation that what we call the Mithridatic dynasty emerged. So out of the chaos of the death of Alexander, there emerged many regional dynasts competing for power. And one of these was a person named Mithridates, gift of Mithras in Persian, probably a member of the Persian nobility, but we don't know very much about him really, who in later years came to be called the founder, and he took his position up about where it says Granicus up there in northwestern Asia Minor. And he emerged as a regional dynast around 300 BC and was able to put together a small principality there as the world was in chaos around him as the successors of Alexander jockeyed for power and the post-Alexander world eventually settled down into the major kingdoms, the Ptolemies, the Seleucids, and several others. And over the next generation or so, I'm not getting any, there we go. Over the next generation or so, Mithridates, the founder here in the area called Bithynia in Northwest Asia Minor, put together a relatively powerful regional state. He made connections with the major powers and without going into the complex genealogical details, one of his daughters married a king of Syria down at the bottom edge of the map here. And over the years, the various Syrian kings became connected to the Ptolemaic kings. To make a long story short, Mithridates, the founder, was one of the ancestors of the famous Cleopatra. By the second century BC, the expanding Mithridatic kingdom, which kind of expanded up to the northeast, up towards Sinope, taking advantage of any weakness in the major powers. Eventually, they came into contact with another expanding power, the Roman Republic. And this is where the terminal fallacy comes into play, because we all know that Rome is going to rule the world. But in the second century BC, nobody knew that. Rome was just another power way off in Italy that nobody in this part of the world really knew anything about. 
but the Romans began to expand. And the first indication of Roman power was when they took on the Carthaginians way to the west. And that, of course, is the era of the famous Hannibal. And after many years, the Romans defeated Hannibal and became a major power. And when Hannibal was defeated, he took refuge in Asia Minor. And so the Romans come to Asia Minor. Initial contact between the Romans and the little principality of Mithridates, the founder, and his sons and grandson were relatively favorable. But eventually, there were territorial conflicts. And we come all the way down to the fifth Mithridates, who came to the throne about 150 and established good relations with Rome, creating a division of territory with the Pontic Kingdom basically to the east, the Roman Republic to the west. The, the kingdom of the Mithridates came to be called the Pontic Kingdom because this region of northern Asia Minor is known as Pontus. It's as simple as that. But Mithridates V was a powerful king. He put together this powerful kingdom, but the Romans were lurking to the west, and everything came into conflict. And about 120 BC or so, Mithridates V was assassinated. Seems to have been something internal within the royal family. We don't know for sure. And his adolescent son, Mithridates VI, succeeded him, and that's our Mithridates. That's Mithridates the Great. He took the name Eupator, good father, Mithridates, son of the good father, perhaps because his father had been assassinated and to kind of demonstrate he didn't have anything to do with it. So Mithridates the Sixth. whom we can see here on a coin. Coins, in many ways, are the most accurate visual representations we have because they're made on the spot. They're made from life. And although the quality of coins may vary, nevertheless, this is probably a pretty good indication of what uh, Mithridates looked like. That mosaic of Alexander the Great I showed a few minutes ago was made hundreds of years later when anybody who knew Alexander was dead. But this is a coin, silver coin, and it shows what Mithridates may have looked like in the beginning of his reign. And we also have a bust of him. Here things are a little more nebulous because this looks suspiciously like busts of Alexander the Great uh, with the uh, lion skin you can see up top, first labor of Heracles. So it's connected with Alexander, it's connected with Heracles. It's the self-image that Mithridates the Great as a young man wanted to promote. He was the new hero. And eventually he would be the new hero who would oppose Rome, but not yet. He simply wanted to establish himself as the new hero of Asia Minor. And he would rule for 60 years, from roughly 120 till 63, steadily consolidating his power, eliminating his opponents. He was away from the kingdom for a year, and when he came back, he found out his wife had a son, and that was the end of her, and other such situations like that, creating in Northern Asia Minor an exceedingly powerful kingdom, becoming, as things got dicier with Rome, becoming the new opponent of Rome since Hannibal. Hannibal had died nearly a century previously, Hannibal had almost defeated the Romans, but it self-destructed. And now this new opponent rose up who was going to oppose the expanding Roman Republic. The career of Mithridates the Great is fairly well documented through the biographies of the Romans who opposed him, 
written by Plutarch. But again, we have the problem that I mentioned at the beginning, and that is these are the people who defeated Mithridates. Although some of Mithridates' own writings survive, none of them is truly biographical. But by now, the Mithridatic kingdom was called the Kingdom of Pontus and began to spread, especially through much of Asia Minor, coming up against the Romans. The Roman headquarters was at Ephesus in the lower left-hand corner. Mithridates is up at Sinope. And so these two powerful entities clash. And it's worth remembering the Romans were nowhere near as powerful as we think of them in later times. The Romans were a new and expanding king, not so much a kingdom, a republic, who would be barely known in parts of the Eastern Mediterranean. So Mithridates the Great, Mithridates Upator, is the only Pontic king whom we know a lot about. His predecessors going back to the founder are vague personalities. But because he was on the throne 60 years, and because the Romans opposed him and wrote about him, we know a great deal about him. But during his early years, after he came to the throne in 120, he was about 12 or 13, his, his rule was far from secure. And he promptly embarked on an ambitious program of expansionism, attempting to encircle the Black Sea. Some of the stuff in purple up here is from a slightly later period, but this represents his kingdom at its height eventually trying to encircle the Black Sea and attempting to control these territories before the Romans did. But again, the Romans probably weren't as much of a threat as Mithridates thought they were. And the north coast of the sea, the area which is the modern Crimea way up there, called in antiquity the Bosphorus because of the little strait <clears throat> that runs from the Black Sea to the modern sea of Azov, there's a myth that a cow could jump over it, the Bosphorus. Uh, that area had long been an area of Greek settlement. And Greeks, traders and merchants had been up there. And in fact, they'd gone up the rivers, uh, Tanais up at the margin of the map at the mouth of the modern Don River. Traders went up it all, almost all the way to Moscow. The, the extent of Greek traders is, is phenomenal, but that, that's another story. But Mithridates, because this was an area of Greek settlement, had a certain compatibility with the people there and sought to bring the Bosphorus region into his own kingdom. The Romans couldn't care less in theory about this, but at the same time, someone who had such an expansionist policy would have been a threat. And the Romans didn't quite know what to do. And they were also worried that Mithridates would move into the lower Danube, which isn't named on your map, but is the river between Harpus and Argamon. That's the mouth of the Danube. That he would move into the lower Danube, go up the river, and invade Italy from the north. In other words, playing Hannibal but Hannibal from the east instead of from the west. And that was something quite relevant to the Romans. And it seems kind of absurd in retrospect that Mithridates would ever really do this. But at the time, we're talking about 100 BC or so, uh, people didn't know what he was up to. In addition, Rome was in civil chaos at this time. The last century of the Roman Republic was a period of almost constant uh, civil war. Probably the most famous event of this civil war is the assassination of Julius Caesar in 44. But other events, uh, the, the movements of Pompey the Great, the involvement of Antony with Cleopatra and the destabilizing that that all caused, all of this meant that the Romans were 
not only not interested in what Mithridates was doing, but at the same time were a little bit nervous and a little bit afraid of him. And when Mithridates' daughter married the king of Armenia over there in green, this created a huge power base running all the way from Mesopotamia almost to the Aegean. And then the Romans began to get nervous. The Armenians had come down almost into Syria. So all of the east, practically everything on the Asian portion of this map was becoming <clears throat> either part of Mithridates' kingdom or connected to him in some way. The Romans had established themselves in what's marked as the province of Asia. Uh, the, the original term of Asia really refers to the western part of what we would call Asia Minor. And they had established a provincial gov government there with headquarters at Ephesus. And Mithridates kind of began to pick off at the eastern side of the Roman territories. And eventually, his plans evolved to the point where he said he was going to expel the Romans from Asia, from Asia Minor. And he even moved further and established his own puppet government in Athens. So by this time, the Romans had a lot to worry about, obviously. And the Romans did not hesitate. The first thing they did was they moved into Athens and they sacked the city and threw the Mithridatic forces out. This, in fact, is something that's very important to archeologists because there's a destruction level of 86 BC, which provides a good datum for the history of Athens. So Mithridates was thrown out of the Greek mainland, and then the Romans moved into Asia Minor and forced the king to accept highly unfavorable peace terms, basically that he'd leave the Romans alone and stay in his own territories. And this is the event that the historians call the first Mithridatic War. It's in the 80s BC. But Mithridates refused to abide by the treaty. He wasn't going to be held down for long. And skirmishing continued into the 80s and into the 70s, which was inconclusive. But the king was steadily building up his forces. One thing that's, that's interesting, and again shows how our perspective can be skewed, is that Mithridates Everywhere he went, he was hailed as the savior, the liberator of the people. And this is the period of great prophecies and oracles and so on. And even though the oracle of the Messiah, the liberator and so on, has been co-opted in early Christian theology, nevertheless, those kinds of oracles were floating around all the time here. Some people thought Mithridates was the great liberator who would save the world from the Romans who now have become a power. Other people applied the oracle to Cleopatra. So things by the 80s BC had become very difficult and a long war that ran from the 80s to the 70s, the third Mithridatic war eventually pushed the king out of Asia Minor and pushed him back into this area, but at great cost to the Romans. Well, we'll leave the chronology there for a moment and talk about the things that kind of make Mithridates interesting, not so much as a warrior king but as an important personality of his era. One thing that is important to realize is that after Alexander the Great, monarchy became the accepted form of government. Monarchy had been kind of discredited with the rise of democracy in Athens and in other states. But Alexander had given monarchy a new legitimacy. 
and the personality of Alexander is overwhelming, even right down into the Roman period. And so if you could be a king, if you could be like Alexander, that won you a lot of points. And generally speaking, the monarchs of the Hellenistic period, the period between Alexander and the Roman Empire, generally they were educated people, educated men and women. They were published authors, and they had broad views of everything, even though they were essentially absolute monarchs. And Mithridates fulfilled this paradigm. He was a practicing physician, and he attracted medical scholars to his court. The Hellenistic monarchs had a court surrounding them of educated and talented people. And they tended to support the arts, architecture. They supported literature, scholarly endeavors. And Mithridates was no different. He had an extensive medical library, and he corresponded with physicians throughout the ancient world. And sometimes we can trace the careers of some of these people, even though they may be relatively vaguely known. Uh, there's a man named Zopirus, who came from Alexandria, the great center of learning of this era, came to Mithridates' court, and then when Mithridates self-destructed, he was out of a job. So he went back to Alexandria and became one of the teachers of Cleopatra. So the, this cross-fertilization is a feature of this particular era. Pharmacology was something that Mithridates was particularly interested in. The best way to get rid of a king is by poison. Other more violent methods have difficulties. And there were several attempts at assassination of Mithridates. Uh, one took place at Pergamon here in the West Center, where a bunch of Italian hitmen were hired to throw him over the edge of the uh, Acropolis of Pergamon. But the plot was betrayed at the last minute. These complex plots never succeed. But if you can get someone who has dinner with the king every night to poison him, that is the best way of getting rid of him. This didn't happen to Mithridates, but it made him an expert in pharmacology because he wanted to develop antidotes. And he spent a great deal of his scholarly endeavors creating a number of antidotes to poison generally herbally based. It's very difficult to look at ancient medicine from a modern point of view because the terms of reference are not the same. But we have some of these antidotes surviving. Whether they worked or not, we really don't know. Uh, we have one based on walnuts, figs, and rue. And whether that saves you from poison, I have no idea. But there's a whole list of them and, and their ingredients. And in fact, eventually one of these antidotes to poison came to be called Mithridateus, Mithridatium. And if you look up in the unabridged English dictionary, the word is still there, meaning a remedy against poison. I think it's fairly obsolete now, but it did come all the way down into the English language. And antidotes called Mithridateus or Mithridatium continued in use into modern times. And we can look at this. This is a gilted terracotta jug that's from the 16th century. It's now in the Getty. It's by Annabale Fontana. And it's a Mithridatium jug. It's, it's what you keep an antidote to poison in. And it shows here a representation of the king being killed, which we'll get to eventually. So the name of Mithridates is still strong in this peculiar way as late as the 16th century. In addition, Mithridates was a scientific gardener. He imported plants. He 
uh, developed new species of plants. And in this, he picked up on a Persian concept, which in Persian is called a paradisos, a paradise. A paradise in Persian basically is an elaborate garden that is completely cultivated and made. And it's what the Greek version of Genesis uses for the Garden of Eden. Uh, speaks of, and of course, paradise comes into Christian thought as well. So the Persians had developed this idea of a well-watered, well-elaborate garden with exotic plants. And the concept migrated west to Mithridates' world, where he would develop these. And we have here, this is not Mithridates, I'll explain in a minute, but it's a good idea probably of what one of these gardens looked like. A luxuriant garden with exotic and unusual plants. You can see fruit trees of various sorts and other things. This is actually a wall painting in the uh, National Museum in Rome, the museum that's right across the street from the train station. And it's a depiction of the Garden of Livia, the wife of Augustus. It's uh, a painting that was in her suite in the house of Augustus. If any of you remember I, Claudius, this was used as one of the sets re fairly regularly. But this is what the Persian Paradisus looked like. It was a place of luxuriant growth and botanical experimentation. And Mithridates, developed all of this, and eventually it was picked up by the Romans who conquered him. The thing that's so common that when you conquer somebody, you take the best of that person and incorporate it into your own world. And eventually, this is what Augustus's wife, Livia, had at her, at her villa in Prima Porta, just north of Rome. So Mithridates identified a number of plants there's an acanthus he identified, which came to be called Mithridatia, and a plant called Eupatoria, after his second name, which is still uh, part of the nomenclature of the plant. It's Agrimonia Eupatoria. Uh, still today, it's Agrimony or sticklewort, uh, something which is not common in the Western Hemisphere, but is common in his part of the world. He imported plants from the Persian world. The cherry tree is the best example. <clears throat> the cherry tree, which is quite common in Italy today, is there because the Romans who defeated Mithridates brought it to Italy at that particular time. So Mithridates was a physician, a writer on medicine, and a scientific gardener. And after his death, his writings were discovered by Pompey the Great, his conqueror. He wrote in Greek. Uh, everybody wrote in Greek then for, for two reasons. One, Greek was the uh, <clears throat> language of scholarship. Even if you weren't Greek, you wrote in Greek. I mean, even uh, King Ashoka in India, the Mauryan king, put out his decrees in Greek at a slightly earlier date than this. And the other reason is that the Latin language was still immature and did not have the complexity and subtlety to write a good scientific treatise or many other things. So Mithridates wrote in Greek, even though he really in one sense wasn't quite Greek. And as I said, his writings were discovered after his death by Pompey the Great and were translated into Latin by members of Pompey's staff, and some of these still survive. They've gotten buried in the ancient medical literature, people like Galen. Uh, we don't have any integral text of Mithridates, but we have a lot of information about his writings. The other talent that the king has had was he was a linguist. It was said that he knew 20 languages. <clears throat> 
Now, that may be an exaggeration. It's hard to come up with 20 languages that he would have been exposed to, but we can certainly come up with the core. Uh, certainly Persian, his own background was uh, originally Persian, and Greek, obviously, Latin, probably Armenian because his daughter was queen of Armenia, and perhaps other indigenous languages uh, in his territories that we don't know very much about. I mean, what did the people in Colchis there at the east end of the Mediterranean speak? What we know about Col Colchis is that's where Jason and the Argonauts went and where the story of Jason and Medea starts. There probably were indigenous languages that he knew if it really gets up to 20. But again, this shows the high level of education. You know, a, a physician, a scientific gardener, a linguist, all of these things, and ruling a kingdom for 60 years. Other foundations included city foundation. That's one thing. Other talents that the king did founded cities. Some of these place names still survive in his part of the world. Eupatoria shows up in several different places. Architectural innovation. This was a period of great innovation in architecture, and Mithridates was on the forefront of that. But his greatest technical achievement was the invention of the water mill. This may sound astonishing, and certainly when I first learned about this, I said kind of, oh, come on. But the point is that in the Greek world, there's essentially no water. Uh, so there's no need for a water mill. A water mill, mill won't work, basically. But in this part of the world, there's lots of water. There are great rivers scattered all over the place. And Mithridates invented a way for milling water. It's, it's exactly what you would expect. There's nothing in you, unusual about it. It just is an addition to the technology of the period in, in question. So hydraulic innovation, we can say, is another element of Mithridates' world. Uh, the water mill is called a hydrolytase, and we don't have any contemporary examples, but we have literary descriptions in the technical literature from the period of Mithridates, so we know exactly what they look like. So that's one reason that Mithridates is quite interested. He had his finger in every pot, but of course he was ruling this kingdom and Rome was getting stronger by the day. Rome had finally defeated Carthage. Hannibal was dead. The Romans <clears throat> had been involved in Asia Minor for some time, but Mithridates didn't really know when to quit. And in 73 BC, after two engagements with Rome when he'd been pushed back, he invaded the Roman territories in Western Asia Minor. He was successful at first, but then his position steadily weakened and he was steadily forced into a defensive position. The first Roman proconsul to go against him was Lucullus, whose name still is used today for someone who likes absolute luxury, a Lucullan feast. And Lucullus, during his years opposing Mithridates, picked up some of the luxurious tastes of the Eastern Mediterranean world. He was known for his great banquets, and also he was the one who brought the techniques of Mithridates gardens to Rome. And he had villas in and around Italy with luxuriant gardens. Well, Lucullus didn't get very far. He was recalled in 68 and replaced by a more famous figure, Pompey, Pompey the Great. Uh, Lucullus was recalled for internal Roman re uh, reasons, not so much because of the way the war was going. Pompey, in the mid-60s now, 
launched a full-scale attack on Mithridates' territories. Remember, Mithridates' capital is Sinope up there. The Romans are based in Ephesus and to some extent in Pergamon. So Pompey gives a full-scale attack on Mithridates' territory, forcing the king to abandon his territory and make an epic retreat up the east coast of the Black Sea eventually ending up in Ponticapium, which you can see up there at the top, which of course was part of his territory. And he thought probably he could reestablish himself there. Pompey uh, pursued him, but soon lost interest because Pompey got trapped in the Caucasus Mountains in the middle of winter and decided maybe chasing Mithridates wasn't the best thing he could do. And as a side issue, the reports that we have of Pompey's expedition are the first reports we have of Romans being involved in high altitude snows. Uh, that, that, that's another point. So Pompey gives up and eventually goes down in Syria and Judea and does some other things. But Mithridates takes up residence there in Ponticapion. And that, that's modern Kerch in the Crimea. And that was an important royal seat. It was a good place to reestablish himself. And he stayed there for several years, planning the future. He brought up the matter of playing Hannibal again. He was going to make this great epic journey up the Danube and down into Italy from the north. Well, most of his staff thought that he'd gone completely bonkers by this time which is probably true. Uh, he, he was about 70 years of age and he maybe had lost some touch with reality because such an expedition would be impossible really to do. And Pompey, of course, had given up on pursuing Mithridates, but one day in 63 BC, the king, who, as I said, was probably in poor health by now, in, in, in his early 70s, uh, looked out from the balcony of his palace in Pantacapayan and saw the troops down there, his bodyguard, proclaiming his son Pharnakes as the new king of Pontus. And Mithridates was very afraid he'd be turned over to the Romans and be shown in a triumphal progression like you see in the sword and sandal epics, the great progression that Romans had for victorious commanders. He didn't want that. And so he committed suicide. And that of course is what we saw. The, the stories vary a bit, either his servant did him in or he did it himself, but nevertheless, he eliminated himself and Pompey was way down in Arabia when he heard the news and he rushed up north and ensured a royal burial for the king. And his kingdom was uh, divided between Roman territory in much of the south and a kingdom under the sun, Pharnakes, in the north, whom the Romans watched very, very closely. And in fact, the descendants of Mithridates ruled this northern area until late antiquity. And so through its various twists and turns, the Mithridatic kingdom was the longest lasting of the kingdoms. It lasted nearly a thousand years from 300 BC until late antiquity through the descendants of Mithridates. So Rome had emerged victorious again, just as they'd emerged victorious with Hannibal a hundred years or so previously, 150 years previously. But Mithridates had gained great respect. Cicero, a few years later, said he was the greatest king since Alexander the Great. And Mithridates became a paradigm for heroic opposition to the ever-expanding Roman Republic. He was seen as another Hannibal. Even though he failed, it was a heroic failure, like the case of Hannibal. And 30 years after his death, we would get another heroic case of opposition, 
and that's Cleopatra, who remember is being taught by people who've been at Mithridates' court. And so those were the three great opponents, Hannibal, Mithridates, and Cleopatra, who in the received wisdom fought heroically but failed to stop the Roman Republic. And others of Mithridates' intellectual circle went and surrounded Cleopatra. And as I said, Lucullus, fascinated by the gardening and fascinated by the plants that Mithridates developed, imported this concept to Rome. And many plants that we now think of as indigenous to Italy came from the Mithridatic world. Well, we have Lucullus's gardens, we have Pompey's gardens. Pompey and it built a theater, which you can still see remnants of in Rome and decorated it with gardens and also put up a statue of Mithridates. You know, the, the heroic defeat of a heroic opponent. And Pompey's theater is famous for one event in history. It's where Julius Caesar was assassinated 20 years after Mithridates' death. And so as the Roman Republic evolved into an empire, many of the characteristics of the Mithridatic world evolved into the Roman Empire. And Julius Caesar, who went too far and was done in, but his successor Augustus adopted many policies of Hellenistic monarchy. In fact, Augustus, whose original name was Gaius Octavius, was born a few months after the death of Mithridates, so the transition was relatively smooth. Mithridates continued to be a model for heroism against entrenched power throughout antiquity and later, a symbol who became romanticized. Uh, Boccaccio saw Mithridates as one of the heroes of antiquity putting him alongside Julius Caesar and Cleopatra. And the Mithridatic jar that we saw continues this tradition. And the king soon entered drama. Racine's Mithridat was popular at the court of Louis XIV. And who the king, Louis XIV, contributed a portrait of Mithridates, which is still visible at Versailles. Opera, Scarlatti's Mithridate Jupitore from 1707, and perhaps the most famous, the early Mozart opera, Mithridate Re di Ponto from 1770. And the king was also remembered as a linguist. In early modern times, the word Mithridates became a synonym for a linguist. Uh, we have a linguistic encyclopedia by a man named Conrad Gester from 1555, which is named Mithridates. And we have several others. And so the intellectual diversity of the king kind of fed out into many modern disciplines. And people are still writing fictionalized accounts of him and, and working on his career and so on. But sitting as he did between Hannibal and Cleopatra, he's one of the last great opponents of the inevitable rise of the Roman Republic as it changed into an empire. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. That was incredible. Um, we have, let's see, a microphone that I can bring around for questions and any questions that might come up in the chat, please just post it. There we have questions. Yeah. Oh, right here. So how did all the documentation of these events 2000 years ago survive and come to us? Uh, how were they uh, maintained through the Dark Ages and all that? Well, uh, the problem, of course, is documentation because, because we have so little and so much is lost. And we just have to take what's there and try and concoct a story, basically. And there are notable gaps. 
Uh, there, there are many years when we have no idea what was happening. And because we don't have Mithridates' own memoirs, if he wrote any, we just have the point of view of the Romans. And they obviously were in awe of the man, but at the same time, they saw him as an obstacle to what we might call their own manifest destiny. And that's just one of the things that classical scholars do. We try to put together this documentation, which is very inadequate sometimes. There were supposedly a uh, million volumes in the Library of Alexandria, and we have almost an immeasurable fraction of that today. So maybe I'm alone in my ignorance, but why do we remember most people who aren't classicists think of, you know, no Caesar Augustus, Julius Caesar, Cleopatra, but this great individual that you've just described, why is he not more commonly known to us? Do you think? Why is Mithridates not more commonly known to people who aren't classicists? Oh, it all has to do with things like school curricula and so on, the kinds of things that are taught. And even though Mithridates has this fairly substantial afterlife, uh, he doesn't have a Shakespeare as Julius Caesar and Antony and Cleopatra did. And I, I don't know offhand any English play about him. We have Racine and I think other plays in French. It's just kind of the luck of the draw. And it's a, it's a problem we deal with every day when we're trying to teach kids this stuff that they, they know they know about Julius Caesar, they know about Antony and Cleopatra, they know about the Trojan War, but there's a lot in between, obviously. Morris has a question online there. If you turn on your mic. Oh. Where are we? Oh. Okay, yeah. Um, it's a kind of a, a silly question, maybe, but when did he get the term, the great? I, I mean, he's a really loser. I hear that very well. Right. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. Here's what he's asking. When, he, yeah. when was he termed the great? Well, how, why was he termed the great? That shows up kind of as a typical sobriquet of prominent kings. I think Alexander's the first example. So if you can be the great, you're like Alexander. We have Mithridates the great. We have Herod the great. We have several examples of this. It's Megale in Greek. And it just becomes part of the title of, of people who are seen as particularly uh, important. Uh, I wondered, you, you didn't mention the one time that I had heard of Mithridates, and thank you for, for a yeah. fascinating lecture. I uh, learned, learned vast amounts. But the first time I had heard of Mithridates <laughs> was in A. E. Hausman's poem that, that ends up, I tell the tale that I heard told. Mithridates, he died old. Yes, <laughs> yes. And it has to do with his study of poisons. And Yeah, yeah. And to... Well, if he's remembered for anything, it's as the poisoner. Uh, and, and the odd thing is that uh, some tradition say that he was poisoned to death, but this is a guy who knew his poisons. He, he wouldn't have been poisoned. Thank you. Yeah, you you mentioned that uh, the period we are we are talking about that Latin was really not very well established at that time. Yeah. So when did Latin become a really well established? Well, uh, when did Latin become established? About this time, the first great Latin scientific authors that we have are Lucretius, and uh, believe it or not, Virgil, who in his Georgics and other things does a great deal of scientific stuff, but the Latin language is very limited and the kind of subtlety that you would get in a Hellenistic scientific treatise, which can be very difficult to read, even if you know Greek well, just isn't there yet. And it really isn't until about the first century AD, again, connected with the political dominance of Rome that you get Latin. But a lot of people, even under the Roman empire, still wrote in Greek people who were fully Romanized. The Emperor Claudius, again, if you remember I, Claudius, the Emperor Claudius wrote in Greek because Greek works much better. <laughs> 
You, you mentioned that his daughter was married to, was a queen of Armenia. Yeah. And I was just wondering, if the, if, if Armenia was a kingdom then, why, wh whether he was able to establish any alliances. Apparently, he wasn't able to establish alliances with some of the other powers in the area that, like, were the remnants of the Persian Empire, the Lassa, or was it yeah. Persia, like Seleucids in Persia? Yeah. Why they didn't help him? No, uh, they grow. did. Uh, oh, okay. It's just, you know, if we get off into these interlocking dynasties, uh, we'd be here all night. Everybody was connected with everybody else, and all of these dynasties intermarried and uh, had children and so forth. That's why, as I said at the beginning, Mithridates, the founder, is an ancestor of Cleopatra, which is something you wouldn't think is the case, but you can follow the path down very, very easily. Armenia was probably the second most powerful state in northern Asia Minor, and that's what's really what scared the Romans, because you've got everything from the Roman territory in the west all the way to the Caspian Sea under one family, and that's when the Romans really began to move. Uh, another thing, of course, uh, about these interlocking dynasties is the limited number of personal names. You know, we have 14 Ptolemies and things like that, and the ancient sources sometimes aren't very helpful in distinguishing them. It's, it's a real minefield sometimes. Uh, thank you for a very fascinating yeah. talk. Can you say something about the end of the Mithridatic line? Can I say what? Uh, something about the end, how the Mithridatic line of kings ended? How the Mithridatic line ended? Well, his son became king, and the Romans watched him very closely. And we have several descendants going right down to about the 4th or 5th century. It's so remote up there that when it was perfectly clear there were no expansionist policies, the Romans weren't really concerned about what happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Romans had taken over all of Asia Minor, so that was off limits to any indigenous dynasty. But they were still up in the, in, in the Crimea until late antiquity, and they became Christianized and eventually fell as so many things to the barbarian movements of late antiquity. But if you go from Mithridates, the founder, down to the end of the dynasty, it's nearly a thousand years, and no other Greek dynasty has that long a track record. Thank you. Is it possible to speculate on what sorts of lessons, either positive or negative, that Cleopatra may have derived from Mithridates? Uh, what did Cleopatra derive from Mithridates? Well, it's is well known, Cleopatra is very much clouded in her own set of mythology and so forth, but <clears throat> we do know that she was well educated. We know the name of some of her teachers. We know that she wrote two or three treatises that we have the names of, but really don't have anything surviving. And again, there's the medical context because that was common in first century BC Alexandria but this, this is also very shadowy. And what we end up with basically is a bunch of names about people we don't know very much about. But we do have a couple of connections from the Mithridatic court to the Ptolemaic, the Cleopatra court. And that makes sense. The same thing when, when the uh, uh, Ptolemies came to an end with Antony and Cleopatra in 30 BC, a lot of the intellectuals went to the one surviving court, that of Herod the Great. This moving around where you could get employment is, is very typical of this period. And when one dynasty self-destructs, you find somebody else. So, so it makes a lot of sense. But again, it's also terribly shadowy. Are there any more questions? If not, I'd like to thank you again for a wonderful talk. Great having you. And thank you for traveling up to be with us today. Yeah.